I'm going to skip most of my introductions today, uh, except to say that Stephen was introduced to me by three or four different paths. It was much more fun to meet you in person than to see you in every third movie that is made. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my. You know, I, I am an actor, a character actor, to be, to be truthful. But today what I wanted to do was to tell you a true story of something that happened to me in my life. It's, it's a story of something that's unexplainable. And thanks to Michael, I'm up here trying to explain it again. Uh, I encountered the miraculous. And I'm not talking about figuring out how to do the shower in the Marriott. <laughs> so many options and so little water. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm talking about a real miracle that I encountered and it completely changed me and it has left me speechless. And whenever I don't know what to do, I have learned not to look for an answer, but to look for a definition. A lot of times, if you have a definition, you will be able to describe what you're looking for, but also just the definition alone can give you the means of obtaining it. So, miracles, definitionally, miracles. There are two main sources of miracles that we experience in, in the modern world. Of course, there's the Bible, and then there are movies on the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> now, they see miracles completely differently. In the Bible, whether it's crossing the Red Sea or the burning bush, a miracle is always something that happens outside of nature, outside of human experience, and it inserts itself to change the course of events. Hallmark Channel. Hallmark Channel doesn't see miracles as happening outside of nature. Usually, a miracle is brought about by the inherent goodness of the protagonist. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about movies like Thanksgiving Miracle, uh, The Dog That Saved Christmas. The story is always the same, whether it's the hardworking single mother with the precocious teenage daughter or the golden retriever saved from the pound. <laughs> it is always the inherent goodness that makes the evil of the world seem to go away. I, I don't know if I buy that. I don't know if I buy either of them, but here, here's my story. And, and you see if you discern where you find the miracle. About five years ago, I was working on a television show and I began to lose my voice. Yeah, you know what that means. It's terrible. It's terrifying. It's the end of life as we know it. In Los Angeles, in Hollywood, if you want to be a working actor, you have to have a voice or well-defined abs. And I'm like pushing 60, I just can't do the crunches. <laughs> so, when I was finally silent, I, I went to a throat specialist, a throat doctor, and he told me that I had a growth on my vocal cord the size of like a macadamia nut. In fact, he said it was one of the biggest, biggest growths he had ever seen, and he wanted to know, truth, this is the absolute truth, if he could take a picture of it <laughs> to send it to a medical publication. And of course, I believe that there's no such thing as bad publicity. So. <laughs> the bottom line was I had to have surgery right away, and the unintended consequences of it was I, I had to be silent for about eight weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks, not a word, not a whisper, not a cough, not a laugh, nothing. If I wanted to communicate, I could write. If I was angry, I could write in red ink. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was about it. But something happened in the silence, and that is I became aware of a second problem. 
I became aware that I had these dull headaches constantly, and it's kind of a little bit of a lie because I knew I'd been having these headaches for a long time, but it was only until I was silent I really paid attention to it. So I went back to the throat doctor and I said, headaches, can you help me with the headaches? And he told me he was a throat man. He, he didn't deal with the headaches. He said I would have to go to a colleague of his, a head and neck specialist. I mean, head and neck specialist, who has a head and neck specialist? Well, I did. <laughs> and I went to him the next day. I got a full series of x-rays, and the head and neck specialist brought me into his office, showed me on his monitor the kind of ghostly images of my head and neck, and he told me that the cause for my headache was not cancer, as I had feared, but was because I had advanced arthritis of the neck. In fact, he said, I had one of the most advanced cases of arthritis of the neck he had ever seen, and I had gotten so tired of doctors using superlatives <laughs> and referring to me. This, this was the real story of what he told me. Apparently, everyone's cervical spine has, has a curve to it, has a curve to it. But my arthritis was so bad, it had warped my, my neck so much that my cervical spine was curved 180 degrees opposite of most uh, every human being. Not only that, but the, the, the vertebra had, had enlarged and twisted. Uh, some of them had fused together, and he said it was progressive. So I left the office deformed, Silent, I went back to the throat doctor and he said what I needed to do was to take a vacation, to get away <laughs> from all of this, get away and relax, something quiet, a quiet pursuit to where my throat could heal from the surgery. So I went with my friend Richard, we went salmon fishing. Uh, this is a mistake. Uh, everybody thinks that fishing is a silent pursuit until you actually catch a fish and then the first thing is, oh shit! So then my wife, Anne, came up with the idea that we should go horseback riding in Iceland. <laughs> now this was actually, I thought, a really good idea because we had been to Iceland twice before to ride horses. We love to ride. We ride all the time. We had friends in Iceland. Uh, we know the language. Well, everybody in Iceland speaks English <laughs> is, is, is what I meant. <laughs> It's a beautiful country with glaciers and geysers, and so we were going to go for 10 days, and the first three days were, was, was going to be this horseback riding trek where all of us riders, we had a herd of 50 loose horses, and we were going to herd these horses over mountains, through rivers, across plains, and we were going to end up on the side of an active volcano. Sounds dangerous. It was! <laughs> The very last ride of the last day, we had to ride our horses over this exposed area of road by the volcano. And it was my turn to go over that road. I went up and suddenly a wind came out of nowhere. I Iceland is known for very unpredictable wind, like Monterey. And this wind was gigantic. It was almost tornadic. Is that a word? Tornadic. It, it lifted me and the horse off the ground, threw us across the road, and the horse took this as God saying, giddy up. <laughs> he landed and took off, and apparently somewhere on the other side of the mountain, he threw me onto a lava flow, which is where they found me. Uh, according to legend, the, 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 <laughs> the, the head of the horseback riding group uh, came over, I jumped up and got on another horse and then said, I felt a little sick. And he said, are you hurt from your fall? And I said, what fall? And he said, get off the horse. <laughs> so, I say according to legend, because of course I was unconscious during that whole period of time. Even though I was walking and talking, I had suffered this incredibly serious concussion and my reality was operating in a 90 second loop. And, and this is actually what I remember from all of that. I remember blackness. 
And then I remember seeing my wife's face, and I said, where am I? And she said, you're in Iceland. You've been thrown from a horse. We're taking you now to Reykjavik to get x-rays. You were hurt. And in my head, I was going like, what? This is impossible. I was hurt? No, I was thrown from a horse. That can't be. What? What? But what I said was, where am I? And Anne said, we're in Iceland. You've been hurt. You've been thrown from a horse. We're on our way to Reykjavik. We're going to get you x-rayed. And then every th I looked down, and I saw that I was in a gurney. I had this metal brace on my head. I heard a siren going on. I realized I was in an ambulance. Darkness came upon me again. And this is where the story gets completely unexplainable. When the darkness cleared, I was in Los Angeles. And I don't mean I was dreaming I was in Los Angeles. I was in Los Angeles. I was at a small party. There was a group of people, a little soiree. I was sitting at a patio. There was a white metal table, uh, painted white, and there were flecks of paint that had been chipped off of the table. And I was sitting there, and someone came out and asked me if I wanted something to drink. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll have some iced tea. I'll have some iced tea, and I sat there, and along the edge of the property were planted roses interspersed with society garlic, and it was near the end of summer. And so there was this smell, this hot old smell of roses and society garlic that was coming across. They brought me my iced tea, and I heard the ice clinking in the glass, and there was condensation on the glass, and there was a drop of water running down the glass, and I grabbed the glass, to drink it, and a couple flies flew around the top, and I batted them away with my hand, and I felt the weight of the flies on my hand, and I drank the tea, and someone asked me what I was doing there. And I said, I don't know, uh, but I think I just wanted to tell everybody here that I'm all right, I'm okay. And they said, well, do you want something to eat? I said, sure. Uh, what do you got? And they said, well, you have some of that hummus and pita bread. I said, bring it on. And I sat there and looked out at the yard, and there's a little swimming pool there, and the wind changed, and I could smell the chlorine in my nose. And I looked up, and I saw two sparrows on a phone line, and they flew away. And I turned, and I saw the hummus and the dip coming out the door, and everything went black. And then there was my wife's face. And I said, where am I? And she said, we're in Iceland. You were thrown from a horse. You've been hurt. We're on our way to Reykjavik to get you x-rayed. And I said, that's not what I mean. A different sentence. And it caught her attention. And she leaned into me and I said, I have to ask you. I know it sounds crazy, but have I been here the whole time? Have I always been here? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, I think I was just in Los Angeles. It wasn't a dream. I was there. And I saw a million things pass through Anne's eyes. And she said, no, you're here. We're both here. We went to Reykjavik. They did more, ex more, more x-rays with their head and neck specialist. And they said that I had fractured a vertebra of my neck, and they gave me one of those goofy white collars that they always use in situation comedies to indicate someone's been injured. Uh, he said that I was fine to spend the rest of my time there in Iceland. Just don't do anything too physical and stay away from those horses. And I said, well, no problem there. So we spent the rest of our week there. Then we flew back to New York, uh, switched planes at Kennedy, and this bearded man came up to me, and he recognized me from the television show Deadwood, which was one of his favorite shows. And he came up to me and said, hey, what's with this thing? Uh, are you using it to get past security? <laughs> it, is it your way to get on the plane quick? I said, no, no, no. I fractured my neck in Iceland. I, I was on a horse, and they gave me this. And he pulled me aside. And he said, 
I am the chief of neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and you are in the wrong brace. You can die in that brace on the plane. Takeoffs, landings, any sudden turbulence. You need to fly all the way to Los Angeles. You hold that brace like this. You hold it like this. I go, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll do it. I'll do it. And he said, and one more thing. Somehow, somewhere, when you get to Los Angeles, you have to find a head and neck specialist. <laughs> the miracle! <laughs> I told him I had a head and neck specialist. Not only did I have a head and neck specialist, but one who already took a series of x-rays of my head and neck just two weeks ago. He said, calm down. Just go back, see him immediately. I went back to see my head and neck specialist the next morning in Los Angeles. They, they listen to you when you say that you have fractured a vertebra. They did a whole nother series of my head and neck. I went back into his office and he turned on those ghostly images of the new x-rays of my head and neck. And he was ashen. And he sat me down and he said, you were misdiagnosed in Iceland. You don't have a fractured vertebra. Your neck is completely broken. Five of your seven vertebra are completely broken, and not only that, but the fourth vertebra is pulverized. You have a fatal injury. Do you want to know why you're alive? Now, by this point, <laughs> I'm in the big cast now at this point. I'm, I'm like this. I go, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he said, you are alive because of your arthritis in your neck. Because your cervical spine was bent 180 degrees opposite of a normal human being, the blow was deflected into your shoulders instead of into your spinal cord. Because your vertebra were distended and enlarged and fused, they acted like armor protecting your spinal cord. You are alive because of your arthritis. And then going back to what I was talking before about definition, about understanding a miracle. This thing, this thing that I thought was my curse, my arthritis of the neck turned out to be my salvation, so I started to wonder what happens if miracle and catastrophe are not these two events that happen on the edge of probability, but what happens if, if they are actually part of the same fabric? and that they're not outside of nature, but are a primary element of nature itself. What if a miracle is an antidote to fate? And if that's true, then how do you access it? And I asked my doctor, how do I heal? And he said, well, it's very simple. After four weeks, the, the bones get sticky, and they kind of find each other and coalesce. And after eight weeks, they form a soft bond. After 12 weeks, they form a hard bond, and you are healed. And I said, that wasn't the question, really, I was asking. I said, the question I was asking was, how does all that happen? Not how long does it take me to heal, but how do I heal? And he said, well, nobody knows that. That's a mystery. And I started to get it. That the miracle I had been looking for was me or part of me. Hallmark Channel was right. I thought all of my life that the greatest access to miracles I was going to have was either through telescopes, microscopes. I had no idea. All I really needed was a mirror. So then I asked this. If we are the miracle, and the purpose of a miracle is to change the course of fate, then it means the next question is, What's going to happen today? Thank you. <laughs>